So, um, yeah, my, uh, ti my talk has the title Small Talk Communication Circuits in Entomopathogenic Bacteria. And I hope that in the end of my talk, I have convinced everybody in the audience that not only we as humans have communication or languages, but also as well uh, tiny little organisms, bacteria have. So, um, in principle, it has been discovered, I think, 20 to 30 years ago, that bacteria can produce uh, specific traits, phenotypic traits, that they do when they are a lot, and not when they are alone or just a few. One example, or well-studied uh, uh, organism, is the marine bacterium Vibrio fishery, which produces light. And it does not produce light uh, when the cell density is low, but only when they are a lot. Another example would be, for example, also not only also for uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but it's also an example for many other bacteria to produce biofilms. You can see here all these cells are organized in this huge matrix uh, that makes the cells quite resistant uh, against environmental stress or so. And um, you can imagine that for these organisms, it just makes sense when they produce these very cost-intensive things like light or biofilm matrix, that just makes sense when there's an effect so that somebody can see the light or that they can organize in a biofilm. And um, so this was the first indication that bacteria might sense how, how uh, much they are. So, and when a certain cell density is reached, meaning a quorum, that they then start to produce their uh, specific phenotypes. Uh, and this, is, um, um, this group body coordinated behavior is mediated uh, by so-called chrome sensing. And uh, the system per se is in uh, principle drawn here. So at uh, the left panel here, the cell density is quite low. And it's known that uh, bacteria release substances, small molecules, into the medium constantly, and when the cell density increases, also the concentration of these small molecules increase. And after reaching a, a threshold concentration, they will then s uh, start to produce specific phenotypic traits, which are indicated here by these blue, blue boxes. Can be light, can be biofilm formation, toxin production, antibiotic production, everything um, what you can imagine. So, and these small molecules uh, let's name it like a kind of language. It's not a language spoken in words like I do, uh, or we all do, obviously, um, but it's a chemical language. And um, so the best studied language among bacteria, especially gram-negative bacteria, um, are, are the so-called uh, acyl homocerine lactones. They're indicated here. So this is a basic chemical structure consisting of a um, uh, ho of a, a homocerine lactone ring or a lactone ring, uh, which is then um, fused to a kind of a hydrophobic side chain. And um, these uh, three uh, basic structures are known. So at the third C atom, there can be uh, there can be uh, no modification, a hydroxy group or a keto group, for example. And um, as you can see here, there is also an R, and R means that it can have different uh, chain lengths, for example, meaning that you have a plenty of molecules that you can have as a homocerine lactone, and uh, different bacteria, for example, indicated here, um, have their specific molecule they can react on. Some also can react with a slightly effect uh, of those homocerine lactone to others, so that one could maybe imagine that this is a kind of bacterial language and many, many dialects are spoken between um, those bacteria. So how is it, this organized? So in principle, the prototypic uh, um, chrome sensing system discovered first in uh, Vibrio fishery, therefore the components are named with LUX, is quite simple. It just consists of uh, two components which are named LUX I and LUX R. And Lux I is a synthase that produces the molecule that then diffuses into the, into the area, which is in the, that case a homocerine lactone. And when a, a specific threshold concentration is reached in the medium, it uh, will be bound by a cognate receptor, which is uh, a, a protein of the Lux R uh, family of uh, proteins. 
And then this uh, receptor is a DNA binding protein. Um, yeah, it dimerizes. It then can a is able to bind upstream specific genes to the promoter region, and then uh, can induce or repress uh, specific genes, uh, ex ex um, expression of specific genes or operons. For example, this is bioluminescence, virulence genes, biofilm formation, as mentioned, but also cell cell interactions, antibiotic antibiotic production has been observed to be under control of such chrome sensing systems. Also listed here, so different kind of uh, gram-negative bacteria and all these specific phenotypes are um, regulated by those homologous systems. Um, so when you take a specific view on these Lux R-type receptors, you can see it's also quite simply organized. So it has a C-terminal helix turn helix motif, which is a DNA binding motif, and an N-terminal um, domain uh, that is called auto int bind in the database, but which, which means that it's, it is a domain where the homoserine lactone, the AHL, binds to activate the protein. And uh, it was also yeah, uh, studied very well by uh, Vittorio in uh, plant associated by bacteria that there uh, are many, many organisms that have so-called uh, called Lux R solo proteins uh, or a genome that which encodes for Lux R type proteins that are not genetically linked with any synthase. And these can, be, can occur besides those organisms that produce, that have an, uh, a circuit uh, which responds to homoserine lactones, can be um, present in AHL producers, or also in those where any Lux I or um, uh, Lux I, Lux R type system is absent. And it has been speculated what, uh, what the function of these Lux R type solos might be. So you can imagine. Um, that it could might respond to exogenous AHLs, for example, that are produced by other bacteria to sense yeah, the community of, of neighbors. Um, um, also other endogenous AHLs, for example, here, that it is sensed with another affinity, of course. Uh, but it could also be uh, an idea that endogenous or exogenous um, uh, compounds are sensed that are not AHLs. And also, especially for those organisms, um, it makes sense. It could be true that there might be another uh, type of uh, chrome sensing or another language with had, which has uh, yet not been discovered. We are working with an entomopathogenic bacterium that is called Photoraptus luminescens. Um, these are quite cool bugs, I think, because um, they produce light. These are the only um, terrestrial organisms that are known uh, that uh, are able to produce light. And the special thing behind these organisms is that they are highly pathogenic against insects and, in turn, um, are symbionts of uh, tiny uh, worms in the soil, um, uh, so-called nematodes, with a specific species, which is Heteroptetes bacteriophora. So these organisms are able to switch between uh, good and bad, meaning between uh, pathogenicity and symbiosis. So the life cycle of the organisms of the bacteria is <coughs> indicated here. So in principle, it, uh, the, the bacteria are associated uh, with the nematodes. They colonize the upper part of the gut. This is uh, indicated here by these GFP-labeled uh, bacteria. <coughs> so that the, the worms um, uh, uh, screening the soil for any um <coughs> for um, for any insects, uh, especially insect larvae, and uh, once they come across, they will bore a hole into the uh, hemocell of the insect and then regurgitate the bacteria. So inject the bacteria into the hemolymph, which is uh, the open blood system uh, of insects. What is then actually happening, so the bacteria are then in a kind of released form, they uh, are apart from the nematodes, and they encode many, many, many kind of toxins. So everything what is known uh, with uh, bacterial toxins, uh, Photoraptus will have a copy. So it's not discovered at all, but uh, all those uh, toxin complexes that act on cyto, um, uh, actin uh, skeleton of eukaryotic cells, and so on and so on which effects that the insect uh, will be killed uh, with, uh, very efficiently within a, a short time, making up one or two days. Uh, during that time, the bacteria also produce secondary metabolites that act as antibiotics to prevent that other bacteria come to the larvae and yeah, who will um, concur about the nutrients. Once uh, 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 the insect is dead, um, you can see the insects glow because the bacteria produce light. Uh, the reason for that is uh, yet not uh, fully understood. 
And then the um, organisms come to a kind of um, symbiosis stage because the sec some other secondary metabolites will support the reproduction and the development of the nematodes. It produces, um, the bacteria produce exoenzymes that convert the candawa to nutrients that are used by the bacteria as well as by the nematodes for growth. And nearly after one month um, from one nematode will be approximately uh, uh, three or four hundred thousand. Uh, when the cadaver is depleted, bacteria and nematodes will reassociate and they evade from the larvae and the nematodes will search for a new insect victim. So why are we studying these organisms? Because Photoraptor species are, have been shown to be um, a huge, um, the genome has, uh, encodes a huge number of Lux R type proteins, especially those Lux R solos. You can see this here. These are um, all these, um, these Lux, R, Lux R type receptors. So Photoraptus luminescence has 40 of them. And you can see here, we have uh, uh, Lux R type receptors of different domain organizations. So two have this typical uh, homocerine lactone binding sites and uh, plenty of them has um, uh, another uh, predicted binding site where we have first indications that it might de detect um, hormones from the insect, but this is uh, not, not yet proven. When we started, um, we were interesting to see what, what is actually going on with these two guys here. So one of those receptors um, this is uh, uh, SDIA and PLUA. SDIA is known from E. coli and from Salmonella that it uh, binds, this is the Lux R solo, that it binds to exogenous um, homocerine lactones produced by other bacteria. Therefore, we thought it could be uh, similar to that, and we were then focused on the other receptor, which hadn't uh, such as a homo homology to another Lux R solo. Uh, so we started uh, in the beginning, we had no idea actually uh, of these two, two guys here of PLUA, especially what is actually the signal and what is regulated uh, by this Lux R solo. Uh, what we did is we, we um, um, uh, made a, pl a Delta PLUA mutant, and as a first step, we have then um, made it a proteome analysis and uh, cultivated the bacteria and uh, screens the proteome for differences in protein, uh, in the production of different proteins. And as indicated here in the PLUA mutant, there are two protein spots completely absent. And um, the corresponding proteins were organized in an operon that was um, yeah, uh, directly located downstream of the gene where the PLUA is encoded. And as you can see here, um, this complete operon here has um, yeah, somewhat uh, similarity or the corresponding proteins have somewhat uh, similarity to proteins of the amino acid metabolism. Um, there's an efflux transporter and later on it emerged that when this operon is produced that uh, a so-called cell clumping factor um, is produced by Photoraptors, therefore we named it PCF, standing for Photoraptors clumping, clumping factor that makes the bacteria clump together. Um, however, we have also uh, proved that uh, on uh, transcriptomic levels, so we have uh, performed northern blob analysis, and you can see here uh, that for these uh, corresponding RNAs um, of these two numbers, PCFD uh, and PCFC, um, that um, these are produced in the wild type in cells uh, upon the end exponential growth phase and not in the mid exponential and uh, less in the stationary growth phase and in the delta blue arm mutant it doesn't obviously produce. So we were interested is, uh, in the signal that is sent. So do these bacteria have uh, speak another language instead of the homocerine lactones? So um, what we did is we uh, first then, or we then um, uh, fused or made a reporter strain and fused the PCFA promoter, so of this target operon to M cherry, meaning that red fluorescence is then a measure for a PCFA promoter activity and therefore for activity of the PLUA regulator. And uh, as already mentioned, in the beginning of, or in the, in the early exponential growth phase, this promoter is completely off and it turns on um, when the cells uh, enter the stationary phase, so in the end of the uh, exponential growth phase. And we have then exposed those cells where the promoter is actually off to culture fluid of cells where the promoter is actually on. And this is indicated here. You can see when we just add medium to those cells here, the, the, they are not fluorescent. fluorescent. When we expose them to culture fluid, uh, the promoter uh, activity goes on. 
which is not the case in the delta blue R mutant. And that means that blue R senses an endogenous signaling molecule that is not yet known because Photoraptus, as mentioned, cannot produce any homocerin lactones. Uh, we then did a lot of extracting of uh, culture uh, fluids and so on, and in the end we uh, performed an HPLC, so it's um, a high pressure liquid uh, chromatography where those molecules uh, can be separated and fractionated and more or less enriched or purified. And as you can see, when using here this column, uh, we could fractionate um, the, the rest of the culture uh, fluid, and we used all this, um, all this uh, fractioned and checked for the presence of the signaling molecule uh, with our reporter strain. And you can see just th three of these fractions were bioactive, meaning that the reporter was on. Uh, so, and that indicated that uh, the signaling molecule was present in these three fractions. And as you might already also see is that not only the reporter activity uh, um, is induced, but also that the cells make these huge clumps. And uh, this comes that because this reporter strain has not only the M. cherry fusion, but also the endogenous PCF operon, which uh, is also activated uh, at high concentrations of the molecule. And so that we do not see uh, just only reporter activity of the fluorescence reporter, but also um, of cell clumping. And uh, we have uh, quite a good co collaboration to uh, the group of Helge Bode in Frankfurt. Uh, they are working with secondary metabolites of entomopathogenic bacteria, and um, um, they have done uh, with our fractions an uh, electrospray uh, uh, ionization, uh, ionization mass spectrometry, and they identified actually the structure of the signal molecule. And this is presented here. You can see this is not a homocerine lactone, it's a different structure. The blue R signal is an alpha pyrone. So at the first view, it looks quite similar. There's also a ring modified with hydrophobic side chains. And you can see in these three fractions, we had uh, different modifications of this molecule. Um, and we named uh, these uh, molecules photopyrons because they come from photoraptors. And these three derivatives, P, P, Y, A, B, and D. So in the end, that we discovered in Photoraptus luminescence a novel kind of bacterial language which has not been known before. So when we uh, checked for uh, activation of these three molecules, when we uh, give it to our reporter strain, um, you can see the gray here is uh, the delta blue R mutant <coughs> and uh, uh, black bars um, is a wild type. When we expose different uh, concentrations of um, either PPYA, B or D, that uh, we are able to activate reporter activity when we give the signals exogenously to the culture. <coughs> And as you might also see, that uh, the most specific was that one. This is the most hydrophobic one, uh, PPYD, um, that um, just um, low picomolar concentrations are enough to uh, start induction of the operon, which is not the case for the other two ones. There is just a low nanomolar concentration uh, sufficient to uh, induce uh, the reporter gene activity. And this is also uh, indicated here. So different concentrations were exposed to um, to uh, photoraptus cultures, and you can see here in, uh, in the chromatogram, uh, these are the pyrones produced, and when we have just PPYB or PPYD at these concentrations, um, they not only induce the uh, reporter activity, the red flu flu uh, fluorescence, but also the endogenous um, uh, PCF operon, making the cells uh, form clumps. And you can see at low concentrations, PPYD makes really huge clumps. So we think that PPYD is therefore the most specific molecule uh, that the bacteria use for communication, uh, but also the other two pyrons would work um, um, to uh, so effectively induce uh, um, the, the um, cell clumping at higher concentrations. So this is just a control at the reporter strain. Also at higher concentrations, we checked uh, whether we can um, activate the uh, target operon with high concentrations of homocerine lactones. But as you can see, this is not the case, meaning that uh, these plu uh, this PLUR receptor is very, very specific to photopyrons as language and not for homocerine lactones. Um, we were then interested to see whether this is really signaling. So whether one cell produces a molecule and another one receives the signal. So that this is really communication and not just endogenously within one cell. Therefore, we have um, um, equipped E. coli with a complete re regulon 
uh, or first uh, the opera one and then with a complete regulon, meaning uh, one time just with a PCFA opera one and also then with plu R. And um, we were able to induce uh, this one because it's in PBAT. So um, by adding Arabinose, you can see here uh, E. coli will also perform those cell clumps. Yeah? Um, but especially when uh, the cells are further equipped with plu R as a receptor, um, these uh, cells can also uh, form cell clumps when uh, PPYD is uh, ad uh, added to the culture. And this means um, that at first, uh, at the first step, that the PPYs are directly sensed. Yeah? So um, not indirectly that uh, maybe plu R might induce another uh, regulator that then induces this operon. So um, this was a really good indication that uh, this signal is really directly sensed by this LUX R-type receptor. And uh, in cooperation with our uh, collaborative partners of the Bode Group, uh, we have modeled the uh, 3D structure of plu R uh, on a structure of uh, another LUX R solo, which is uh, QCSR. It's responding, it responds to uh, homocerine lactones. It's from another bacterium, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And um, maybe you can see this here. It is quite similar. So in light green, this is uh, QCSA. And it's in gray, this is uh, plu R. Um, obviously, it's, uh, the structure is um, yeah, quite similar to homocerine lactone um, uh, responding proteins. And you can see here, this is the DNA binding domain, and this is the N-terminal part where the uh, signal is sensed that here in this pocket, uh, the pyrone uh, can be docked in uh, via a computer model, and it perfectly fits also into this uh, binding pocket. And it looks like really a kind of car that then sits on the DNA, and once it's activated, it starts a transcription. So quite funny, I think. Um, when, we, when you compare different kind of uh, lax R type proteins, those that respond to homocerine lactones with uh, our plu R protein, um, we could uh, observe that they are not uh, highly conserved. In the C-terminal domain, you can see with the black amino acids, this is a DNA binding uh, domain, they are more conserved than in the signal binding domain. Um, within uh, homocerine lactone binders, just um, six amino acids are really, really highly conserved in more than 98% of homocerine lactone binders. However, in plu R, um, these are uh, the marks here with these red arrows. In plu R, these are just um, two of these six uh, highly conserved, what is in homocerine lactone binders conserved. Um, they are uh, present in uh, plu R and um, so that these positions have been somehow, uh, somehow exchanged. Um, we thought that this might be due that plu R can respond to another signal instead of homocerine lactones. And um, so this, these are the two amino acid uh, residues. This is uh, um, Y66 and D75. And uh, when we um, tried those docking experiments, so meaning that the signaling molecule is bioinformatically docked into the binding uh, pocket, uh, we could um, then directly observed that uh, the pyrone, which uh, maybe it's, uh, you can see this, uh, that all this uh, um, uh, amino acid residues are located in this binding pocket domain, tyrosine 66 and aspartic acid 75 are closely re uh, um, related to where the pyrone um, ring is actually located. But also the other uh, amino acid residues, which are at the similar positions of this highly conserved amino acid residues in AHL binders, are closely related into that binding pocket. And um, you can see this here, maybe again. So these are these six uh, highly conserved amino acids. They somehow form the uh, signal binding pocket of the regulator. And um, so when uh, we had uh, this reporter assay here, uh, for plu R activity, and when we exchange uh, amino acids, um, uh, tryptophan, um, uh, tyrosine uh, 66, or aspartic acid 75, you can clearly see that uh, reporter activity goes down, meaning that these um, amino acid residues are quite essential for signal binding and therefore for functionality of the protein. Okay, so far to uh, the re receiving of uh, um, the signal. So what about um, uh, the synthesis? So how is the language spoken and not only uh, um, uh, received by the bacteria? 
Uh, so in principle, it was not known before um, how these pyrons could actually be uh, synthesized. But um, our chemists came on the idea that um, these uh, precursor molecules come from the pet uh, fatty acid primary metabolism. Um, you can see this here and uh, at with, um, with um, small hydrophobic molecules with an acyl carrier protein. And because you have these two keto groups here, uh, that a ketosynthase similar enzyme um, is necessary to uh, form these two molecules to ring. Yeah? And um, therefore, uh, they had the idea to look for, um, for putative proteins that have um, uh, ketoaxyl uh, synthase similar domains that are not involved into the primary metabolism of the bacteria. So these are all so-called unknown ketosynthases. And what they did in Frankfurt is they knocked out these genes and checked whether uh, the photopyrons are in the supernatant of the uh, bacterial cultures. And um, just uh, within, uh, within uh, when uh, within this knockout, this is also the gene name PLU4844, uh, um, they uh, haven't found any of these photopyrons anymore, and therefore this, uh, um, this uh, gene was renamed, or the corresponding protein was renamed to PPYS, standing for photopyron synthase. And you can see this here, so this is again Photoraptus wild type, the um, uh, presence here of the pyrons is indicated here by this uh, chromatogram and also um, endogenously um, added uh, culture fluid activates reporter activity of the PCFA reporter strain. That is not the case uh, in the PPYS mutant, so the pyrons are absent and the supernatant or the culture fluid is uh, not able to induce reporter activity anymore. And uh, uh, we were also able to equip E. coli with all these uh, synthesis genes, um, meaning with a photopyron synthase and with an operon, uh, which enables E. coli to produce this isobranched fatty acid, so that the native uh, pyron that is also produced by photoraptors can then be produced by E. coli. And you can see this here um, coming up of this, uh, this peak stands for that E. coli culture fluid now contains the photopyrons. And when we add this culture fluid to our photoraptors reporter strain, we see reporter activity because the signaling molecules are present, which is not the case uh, in the uh, E. coli strain that just carries the empty plasmids. So that really says, okay, um, uh, the molecules, the photopyrons, which are the, the signals for PLU-R, uh, are produced by this enzyme, this photopyron that we named PPYS. So, and again, I already mentioned it, we also wanted to know whether there is an exchange between the bacteria. So we had uh, our strain, uh, E. coli strain, that is able to produce uh, the photopyrons because it has the specific synthesis genes and we um, have the E. coli strain that carries um, the PCF operon and PLU-R. And uh, when we mix these two uh, strains together, we see that E. coli forms cell clumps. And that cannot be endogenously because we have just a producer, stra a producer strain and a responder strain. And it will then form uh, to this, uh, it will then come to this phenotype. This is not the case for the control strain. You can see this here. Um, one strain produces the pyron, the other strain receives the signal, makes the clumping factor, and all cells will clump together. That stands for that photopyrons are really used for communication from one cell and received, uh, the signal will, uh, is received by uh, the other, um, by the other um, uh, cells. Therefore, we could show that PPYS and PLUR is a novel kind of chrome sensing or cell-cell communication system. So uh, we also checked whether PLU-R or the communication is involved in the strong phenotypes that um, uh, Photoraptors has. I already mentioned that it's highly pathogenic towards insects, but however, when, um, uh, when just inactivating some genes in Photoraptors because it has a plenty uh, uh, a reservoir of different kind of toxins, it will kill our bioassay, meaning the insect larvae. But however, when we uh, inject now the E. coli strains that produce the clumping factor, so the readout of uh, the communication system, we saw that uh, normally harmless E. coli uh, will be able to efficiently uh, uh, kill insect larvae again. 
And uh, the thing behind is that we think that the cell clumping protects the cell that is injected into the, uh, into the uh, insects, uh, that uh, they are protected by the innate um, 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 immune system of the insects. And therefore, E. coli, uh, at least you need high cell number, higher cell numbers than Photoraptor for, for doing that. But um, you can see that um, E. coli is then somehow protected, that uh, it's not cleared by the, uh, by the hemolymph, and uh, that the cells um, are protected and make a sepsis, which finally will kill the insect larvae. And this is not the case uh, when E. coli um, are injected that have just uh, um, yeah, the empty plasmid. So summarizing this part, so I hope that I could convince you that we had um, have discovered a novel type of bacterial communication system, novel kind of language, uh, which does not uh, um, have um, uh, acyl homocerine lactones and no lux I protein for, uh, for synthesis of the signal, but this is PPYS, which synthesizes the, the signal, in this case the photopyrons, and they are received by the lux R type receptor PLUA, which then activates uh, the PCF operon, which finally comes to cl cell clumping, um, so that uh, when uh, reaching a higher cell density, that the cells make these clumps to be then protected uh, for the insect immune system, and therefore the cell clumping uh, contributes to insect pathogenicity. Okay, there are um, at least um, three uh, Photoraptor strains known uh, up to the present time. The other one, Photoraptor temperata, has a similar system uh, compar or comparable to the luminescence one, also communicating via homocerine lactones. Uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, uh, by photopyrons. Um, Photoraptor asymbiotica is not only insect pathogenic, it's also pathogenic against humans. It was first isolated from rounds of patients. Um, of Australia and uh, Northern America. So, uh, because normal, uh, photo normally Photoraptors uh, cannot grow under conditions in humans because it cannot tolerate 37 degrees, but Photoraptors temperata can, and therefore uh, it makes this, uh, this bounce in, in humans. And the interesting thing behind is that also Photoraptus asymbiotica um, has this PCF operon, uh, which uh, encodes uh, directly next to it a lux -R type uh, receptor, a lux -R solo, uh, that we named pow -R in this case, but it has neither a lux -I protein nor a, a photopyron synthase. So we were wondering uh, what actually, what could be the signal for pow -R, which is the homologue of PLUR. So in principle, uh, what Photoraptus luminescence uh, is not used to do, but what Asymbiotica uh, really uh, does is that it produces, instead of photopyrons, very high concentrations of tho those called dialkyl resort signals and the, um, the precursors, uh, the cyclohexane dions which are indicated here. And our colleagues from Frankfurt, they had already isolated the substances and thought maybe check it, uh, whether it activates uh, your PowR receptor somehow, because they look from the size quite similar to the pyrons and to the homocerine lactones, but they are chemically completely different. So that we did, so we constructed a reporter strain and um, checked for all these molecules which are indicated here, so also for photopyrons and homocerine lactones. So uh, we were not able to activate reporter activity of PowR uh, by addition of these molecules, but as indicated here, when um, adding the dialkyl resort signals or also the cyclohexane DOs, we were able to fully or uh, um, uh, specifically induce uh, uh, the um, PCF operon uh, of Photoraptus asymbiotica, which means that the alkyl re resort signals is another novel bacterial language that is spoken by Photoraptus and not, has not yet been shown in as any other bacteria. And you can also see, as already mentioned, we have this ring structure again with this hydrophobic side changes, uh, chains. And <coughs> therefore, yeah, the size of the molecule seems to be somewhat similar because it has to fit into this binding pocket of the lux R type receptors. But in principle, uh, it's a different chemistry behind. 
So it was already known from the Bode group <coughs> um, how these molecules are synthesized by Photoraptos. So there's an operon needed. Uh, this is called DA, standing for D-alkyl DA A, B, and C, which encodes an oxidase, a ketosynthase, and an acyl carrier protein, which then uh, also the uh, precursors come from the fatty acid metabolism of the bacteria, and then um, these molecules are cyclased so that and finally these dialkyrisorcinols with different uh, side chain lengths um, will be, perf will be um, produced. And <coughs> we also checked this uh, in Photoraptos asymbiotica, um, whether the production is uh, really uh, true, whether the, the DA operon is, um, uh, is uh, really the synthesis for our signaling molecule. So the similar reporter strain, except that it's not Photoraptus luminescence, but Asymbiotica with the PCFA promoter and cherry fusion. You see that wild type makes the cell clumps and also induces uh, somewhat the re reporter activity, which is not the case in the delta pau R mutant. When uh, the DA gene is knocked out so that the cells cannot produce the alkyrosorcinols anymore, we can see no, an no any further uh, in induction of the reporter. When we add exogenously purified the uh, alkyl in no low nanomolar concentrations, uh, reporter activity can be observed and also cell clumping. And also when we equip E. coli, uh, which can produce this, uh, um, this um, isobranched fatty acids uh, with a DA operon, uh, this supernatant is also sufficient to induce reporter activity in Photoraptus asymbiotica which the normal the control stain that has not these genes uh, is not able to do. And um, in contrast to Photoratus luminescence, we had an even stronger phenotype. So also um, um, this operon, um, when uh, E. coli is equipped with, um, uh, uh, with the PCF operon of Photoraptus asymbiotica, you can see that it um, uh, makes the insect larvae to die. But in this case also when we had the delta pau R mutant, so which is not able uh, for communication anymore, that we, we see a really reduced um, uh, pathogenicity against insect larvae. So that also in that organism um, it has a similar function, but it is much more important uh, somewhat uh, for, this, um, yeah, for fulfilling the function as a pathogen than it's the case for the other strain. And <coughs> while just some other pseudomonads or so are able to produce pyrons, so pyrons is not a very often spoken language. Uh, when we have done a comparison um, of all those ketosynthases, you can see here, um, the, the DABI um, synthase is quite, uh, uh, quite often distributed. So these are other ketosynthases. This is PPYS. You can see just a few organisms have this PPYS, but many, many organisms have DABI. So many, many organisms um, can um, really produce the alkyl resort signals. And when checking whether those organisms, we have found this in at least 116, and um, that uh, 45 of them have a Lux R solo uh, and no Lux I, so um, that these organisms m also might uh, speak the alkyl resort signal as language, uh, which the others are not used to do. And some of that uh, could also be multilingual, so they speak Homo serine lactone and also the alkyl resort signal. But these are just two of the 116. And as you can see here, I've listed some of the uh, genie. Um, here there are also some pseudomonads or hemophilus uh, species, so many, many uh, bacteria under these 116 are human pathogenic, yeah? make somehow infections or severe infections in humans. So that we think that Photoraptus asymbiotica might have evolved to speak another language, that it might be an important for a human pathogen that has to resist at 37 degrees, that it's not very good to speak uh, uh, photopyron. Uh, but that um, it is um, more important to then um, yeah, evolve to, to another language, to the alkyl So just summarizing this part, 
I hope I could convince you that in Photoraptus asymbiotica we have instead of Lux I or PPYS we have this DAR synthesis operon making uh, the signaling molecule, which is in that case a dialkylresorcinol, um, and upon high cell densities it uh, binds to uh, pau R, the Lux R or the pau R homolog in Photoraptus asymbiotica, and also activating uh, expression of the PCF operon, making uh, cell clumping and therefore contributing to pathogenicity. And also in POW-R, uh, we, we found these, uh, these few amino acids that make this binding pocket somehow. Um, and there are uh, also some uh, of those uh, which are close by to, to the ring structure where it's predicted to bind. And when we uh, exchange these amino acid residues, um, you can see this here, also reporter activity goes down, meaning that yeah, uh, that is the first indication that also the alkylresorcinol is directly bound by power R and that uh, these amino acids somehow are involved in forming the binding pocket. And when you now compare <coughs> all those Lux R solos, um, you can see this motive I've mentioned um, before that we have the six highly conserved uh, amino acid residues in um, AHL speaking bacteria. So that this might be a motive um, for sensing AHLs and in blue R or POW R only two of them are present is, uh, is this uh, Y residue and this D residue the other ones are exchanged so that it might be a typical motive uh, for that one with the CS in the end for pyron sensors and YI um, in, this, uh, in the end for the alkylresorcinol sensors however we also tried to, um, to convert single amino acids to uh, get another kind of motive, for example, uh, the DAR motive to change it to the PPYS motive, um, and also all six amino acids converting it to, um, to homocyrine lactone motive. The sensor was not functional, but it was not responding to the other signaling molecule, meaning that this six, uh, six amino acids do not make up the complete specificity of signal binding, but they just contribute, and other amino acids in the N-terminal binding pocket are somehow important to detect the right molecule. You can see this here. We have also performed uh, also in flu R and POW R several amino acid replacements, which are predicted to form the binding pocket. Um, not only uh, neutralized uh, uh, amino acid, also uh, um, performed chain length and so on. And maybe what is important to know is um, that when you overproduce uh, the Lux R type receptors, uh, you will always induce reporter gene activity because you will have a conformation which is kind of randomly achieved that is sufficient to activate the target operon. Meaning um, <coughs> that uh, all derivatives or those derivatives that were able to induce reporter activity when upon overexpression are in principle functionally active and those um, that are functional active and do not respond to the uh, corresponding or the respective signaling molecule anymore, that there uh, is a decreased linked binding. <coughs> and you can see some of those uh, um, derivatives um, are have conformational defects somehow, but most of these amino acids uh, shown by this replacement show uh, fully functionality in principle, but show decreased ligand binding. <coughs> so when comparing all those languages or this language molecules, let's say like, say like that, um, it becomes visible that they all um, have precursors which comes from the primary fatted, fatted, uh, fatty acid metabolism, as you can see here. So we have <coughs> the homocyrine lactones, uh, also um, I think 10 years ago there was a derivative, a, a real homocyrine lactones uh, found uh, as a language. We have found um, the pyrones and the dialkylresorcinols um, and uh, in Pseudomonas PQS, this is a Lys R type receptor, but the size of the signaling molecule is quite similar. So these are uh, the, the known languages of gram negative bacteria. In gram positive, it's, it's different again. And you can see that all use a, a principal set of molecules uh, as precursors for just performing the right signaling molecule. And <coughs> let me uh, make it more abstract. So this is very, very well known and many, many bacteria as well studied that they speak a kind of language. So we would think that um, 
the, the ring or the, the specificity uh, makes up the language, which can be understood by some, by some sets of bacteria and not by the others. And that all those derivatives here, these side chains like ours, we have also uh, within the photopyron set and also in the dialkyl resorts, you know, are somewhat dialects that can also be understood by uh, other bacteria when they uh, increase um, their concentration. And a dialect is something, for example, I come from northern Germany, as you mentioned, there is no German dialect, but uh, I can also understand Bavarian speaking dialect uh, people. Um, but when you go further to, uh, to north in Germany, the dialects become uh, completely crazy. So that a Bavarian will not understand a northern German, but when you are neutral, you can uh, yeah, understand both. And this might be a similar uh, principle with bacterial language molecules, just on a very abstract way. So that I can summarize this part that uh, English was already discovered, so many bacteria speak English. We have discovered German-speaking organisms and Italian-speaking organisms, of course. So that we met up now with our uh, studies, a set discovering really two novel languages and not only novel dialects, for example, uh, which belongs to the similar um, chemical group. A uh, special, special thanks goes to our colleagues from Frankfurt because they are really, really great chemists. So this is Helge Bode. Uh, this is an Alexander Brachmann, he's a former, um, PA, uh, former postdoc, he's now in Switzerland, and also Darko is uh, fi finally finishing up his uh, PhD. He w they were also involved in, in identifying all these molecules. Just this is uh, my team in Munich. Um, so many, many former uh, students have worked on the system, but the, most, uh, the person who did most uh, invented in this cell-cell uh, communication is Sophie Brahmeyer. Um, she has just uh, finished her PhD. He's, uh, she stays in Munich in the lab of Kirsten Jung. Uh, we are quite happy about this. Uh, were she was really quite successful uh, in discovering all these uh, bacterial languages and making all those experiments. These are our collaborating partners. Already mentioned Helge Bode, Alexander Brachmann from Frankfurt. Also have collaboration with David Clark, Susan Joyce in Ireland, uh, with Onilda Santos da Silva in Brazil research for antimicrobials against uh, dengue fever, and of course also with our uh, head chair, Professor Kirsten Jung uh, from the LMU. And finally, let me close with a similar language that I started my talk. So uh, let me say, mille, mille grazie a lei per l'attenzione. Grazie. <laughs>